tonight on Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial. New insight and a new voice from the jury. The jurors didn't really know how to vote on the jury slips. A possible fourth juror coming forward, claiming Reed would have been acquitted on two charges. Dominoes have fallen. That's the best way I can say it. Plus, growing fallout. A second law enforcement officer now on leave. <laughs> Canton Confidential, the Karen Reed murder trial starts now. Reports of another juror coming forward confirming that Karen Reed was found not guilty on two of the three counts against her. Good evening and welcome back to Canton Confidential. I'm Glenn Jones. I'm JC Monahan. In another motion filed by the defense this week, attorney Ellen Jackson shares the concerns of juror D. Now, according to that affidavit, Jackson was contacted by a fourth juror on Monday. They described the last day of the trial as a whirlwind. And when asked if other jurors would agree with their statements, this juror, again, juror D, said, quote, Every one of us will agree and acknowledge that we found Karen Reed not guilty of counts one and three because that's what happened. Now, this comes amid more fallout in the town of Canton. Last night, we learned Canton police officer Kevin Albert was placed on leave during the Karen Reed trial. You'll remember his brothers are Canton Select Board member Chris Albert and the former owner of the home where John O'Keefe was found, Brian Albert. Both of them testified as witnesses for the Commonwealth. So we'll have much more on that a little later in our show. We want to begin with Kirsten Glavin live in Dedham with the latest on the motions. Well, all of this begs the question, was a mistrial declared too soon? The most recent juror to allegedly come forward, according to that juror, told the defense that at uh, some point they were uncomfortable with how this trial ended. In yet another twist to the Karen Reed murder trial, a fourth juror allegedly coming forward stating the jury did come to verdicts on two of the three charges Reed is facing. Not guilty to second degree murder and leaving the scene of a fatal crash. It's really imperative that uh, this be taken care of as quickly as humanly possible, that we got to have to get this clarified on what actually happened in that um, jury deliberation room, and did they, in fact, uh, reach a verdict on two of the counts? In new documents filed by Reed's defense team on Wednesday, the additional juror, referred to as Juror D, told attorney Alan Jackson the following. Jury believed that they were compelled to a resolution on all counts before they could or should report verdicts on any of the counts. After discussion, the jury decided to inform the court that they were deadlocked and they expected they would get further instruction about the remaining decided counts thereafter. Juror D explained that he, she was confused and upset that such further instruction never came. Juror D allegedly making several statements, including, is anyone going to know that we acquitted Karen Reed on count one and three? No one ever asked about those counts. I can see where... The confusion may have started when the only message the jury gave is that they just could not come uh, to an agreement. Double jeopardy concerns now once again being raised. All of this following a motion to dismiss the two charges, which was filed on Monday. None of us have really seen this before, so we would be in uncharted territory, but I th think that it would certainly be permissible to, if, if they find out that the verdict was really reached by the jury to honor the verdict, and on the two counts, and then to uh, continue with the mistrial on uh, the uh, remaining count. Now, the Norfolk District Attorney's Office is reiterating what they told us on Monday, and that is that they're examining this motion that was filed and anticipating, anticipate filing a response. Again, there is another hearing scheduled for July 22nd, so we'll see what comes of that. Glenn, JC. Kirsten, thank you. We want to bring in one of our legal experts, Michael Coyne, dean at the Massachusetts School of Law. <laughs> Michael, you thought you were on summer break, and yet... <laughs> no you, chance. No way. We bring you back in. <laughs> we need you desperately because we want to talk about the confusion surrounding these jurors. So according to the motion that was filed on Monday, Juror A reached out to the defense attorneys directly. And then the attorneys say, well, they got information from two other jurors labeled B and C, 
through intermediaries. And now we're learning a possible fourth juror, labeled Juror D, also reached out directly to Karen Reed's attorneys. So that's two jurors directly contacting the defense, two other jurors reaching out to the defense through a middleman sort of thing. So there's been a lot of chatter online. How many are there really? Could they be double dipping here? Can you clarify for us if we even know at this point? Are we talking two jurors, three jurors, or clearly four jurors based on what the defense has said? I think based on the affidavits that have been filed, we know that there are two jurors that have come forward, A and D on their own. Uh, and D has even said that they would be prepared to come forward and testify in court with respect to the decision that she, that he or she says that they reached as long as her uh, privacy was maintained and that her identity could be uh, kept secret uh, as well, she would then or he would then come forward and testify in court with respect to it. I do not believe that juror A said the same thing and B and D uh, came to us from intermediaries, what we call hearsay. So we're not really sure what B and C uh, would be prepared to do should the court move forward with the next step. But that's really the question here is what is the next step? And, and I wish I could tell you definitively what the appropriate step is under the law, but we've never had a situation like this. I think what the court has to hope, what we all have to hope is more jurors come forward and either support the present version of the events and say, no, we definitely came to an agreement on uh, the first and the third count or other jurors come forward and say, no, there was never a vote on those counts, and so therefore we didn't decide it definitively. And if that happens, I think then the jury verdict form will control. And what we are looking at on the jury verdict form is there's no decision with respect to any of the charges that they had before them. All right, Michael, I need you to suffer through one of my metaphors, because this feels to me like a four alarm fire for Judge Canoni. And if she doesn't put it out quickly, it's going to burn her. Is that fair or have I overstated it? I don't think you've overstated it, Glenn. It really is a problem. My guess is, if you think about it, at the end of this eight to nine week trial, she had probably felt some relief, even if the jury was deadlocked and the thoughts of having to retry it. And the fact that it could end and then all of a sudden reignite so quickly, I don't think that's a bad analogy at all. Uh, and my guess is she is saying to herself at this point is that she probably could have done a, a better job cleaning up this at the end. Under Rule 27 of the criminal procedure, uh, when a jury comes back with a mistrial, it is the rule that requires that the judge inquire whether they reached a verdict on any of the counts before them. We know that wasn't done here, but in part it wasn't done on the strength of the multiple notes they sent saying that they were hung up on the charges. I mean, you've got to remember here, at no point did they say, you know, in reporting to the judge, hey, we, we did our, uh, at least part of our job. We found a verdict on counts one and three, but we're tied up on count two. And the defendant never objected to the declaration of a mistrial. So the law would tend to support, assuming that we don't have more jurors come forward either way, uh, to, to not invade the jury's province like this, because there's a lot of case law that says we shouldn't inquire into internal deliberations of the jury. Now, that's a slightly different question, though, to say, well, should we, do we have the ability and shouldn't we have the ability to inquire as, did you reach a verdict on those counts and what was it if you did? Michael, there's so much about this, though, that seems like, you know, looking in hindsight, Alan Jackson is, you know, supposedly one of the best defense attorneys in the country, at least based on his resume. It doesn't seem to me like this would go over his head. In other words, am I, are they so constrained in those moments that they couldn't stand up at that moment and ask Judge Canoni to poll the to, to poll the jury or ask right in that moment to see the jury slip and how they filled it out? Because it's like Monday morning quarterbacking, all of these things they're saying they wanted or needed, they couldn't have gotten that moment that day? No, they could have. First of all, he is a uh, stellar attorney. He he tried a, uh, an effective case. Uh, he's tried other effective cases. He's a very good lawyer. Uh, 
the moment uh, when the verdict, uh, when the no verdict came in and the mistrial was declared, uh, people will Monday morning quarterback and, and say, well, why didn't you, A, object to the mistrial declaration? Because that will be an issue on appeal with respect to the question of double jeopardy. And why didn't you ask that there be further clarification on the charges? Uh, whether they were able to reach a verdict on any of the charges. But, you know, after five days of deliberation, uh, where that it, now it became less certain that you were going to get a not guilty conviction, they may very well have made a strategic decision that they didn't want any further clarification. Remember, the jury at that point on the second count was eight to four guilty based on the affidavits the defendant's lawyers had filed. You might not have wanted to send them back out to see if they could have moved more jurors to reach consensus on the involuntary manslaughter. So it may have been a strategic decision to allow this issue to remain on appeal. Um, but we, we really don't know unless they tell us why they didn't make objections or ask that the jury be polled collectively. You can't do it individually because on when you're declaring a mistrial, you want to be clear and careful that you don't try to intimidate jurors and get them to change just to go along with the majority. Mm -hmm. Michael Coyne, thank you as always for your analysis. That last point is so key because then they would get a win on the date of the mistrial and potentially a second win now. Mm -hmm. Still ahead, our courtroom insider and commentator Sue O'Connell will join the conversation. She reflects on how the jury reacted in those moments right after the judge declared a mistrial. Stay with us. You're watching Canton Confidential. Welcome back. Joining us in studio tonight is our courtroom insider and commentator, Sue O'Connell. Sue, we're hearing through the defense about these potentially four mm -hmm. jurors, and they're talking about at least one of them specifically, how they felt in the moments when a mistrial was declared mm -hmm. and they were excused and left the room. And they're saying it was abrupt and they were surprised it end ended like that. Did that is that how it felt to Absolutely. you? Absolutely. And it felt abrupt to me, too. I mean, it, you know, this is the part about being in a courtroom for this. We knew they were going to come back and she was going to de declare a mistrial because Judge Canoni said it right before the jury was in the room. And then they came in and uh, she said what she said to them and said, well, I'm declaring a mistrial. And you could see the body language, like people in the jury just kind of sat back and then leaned forward. And then she said, thank you for your service or whatever she said to them. And they all just kind of stood up and looked at each other. One juror was very emotional and, and crying a bit. And then they walked out and then they went right to scheduling this July 27th. And I was like, wow, we have just pivoted from a mistrial to let's get something on the schedule to figure out what we're going to do. I don't know where they went after, if they went to the room or they went right to the bus. Didn't she say, though, I'll speak to you in just a moment? I thought, I thought she, she did, did. But it was, it was this abruptness of it that they... Uh, and, and again, we were talking earlier. We knew that because of the, uh, the ruling, that the, the instruction that she gave them, the, the dynamite instruction, that she was going to have to declare a mistrial. I don't know if they knew that. Right. Sure. So they they got the instruction. They come in and say, yep, we're still hung. And they're like, OK, mistrial. So it might have been surprising to them. And to Michael Coyne's point, they didn't communicate. You know, it's not on them I'm, I'm at all. Right, right, critical, right. But, you know, they it was a mistrial. It was hung. Play out a hypothetical for me. Let's say the defense is successful in getting charges one and three dismissed. And the Commonwealth decides to retry on count two. Mm -hmm. What do you expect the public sentiment to be around that decision? So it's interesting because we've been talking a lot about this. Uh, one thing I've learned from the Jackson Yanetti team, like I would be wondering, like, well, why would you put a motion forward if it looked clearly like the jurors could find Karen Reed guilty of manslaughter? How does that help the defense? Now, as we all know, sometimes news is just news. We don't know if it's good news or bad news. It's right. just news. So what is the idea of pushing forward an idea, th this, this motion, that, that that finding, the manslaughter, could be retried again? How does it help the defense? I don't know. But it also means uh, I, I, lots of people have been involved in this, obviously. And if there's going to be another trial, it's going to be hard to find people who have not at all heard about this or had an opinion about it. So maybe it's also just about keeping it in the news. That's, I was... That's what I was saying. There's, is there strategy behind this? Yes, you know, there's you, absolutely. Because you don't like to think it. of the court system as a, a game of chess, but it, it, but it absolutely mm, yeah. it well, is. Well, if that is the strategy, yep. it does appear to be working. Yep. <laughs> All right, Sue's not going anywhere. She's staying with us. She's going to join us a little later on our show. But first, an update on the fallout happening in Canton. 
Listen, select board meetings in Ken have been spicy since this case began more than two years ago. Well, things got really heated last night. After the break, what we're learning about the investigation of a Canton cop with ties to the Karen Reed case. Uh, Chief Rafferty has placed Kevin Albert on paid administrative leave while an outside and please be quiet. While an outside a major announcement at last night's select board meeting in Canton, you heard some applause from the crowd there when it was revealed Canton police officer Kevin Albert was put on leave. He's the latest law enforcement officer to come under scrutiny as a result of testimony in the Karen Reed murder trial. Kevin Albert was not part of the Reed case, but he did work on a separate investigation with state police trooper Michael Proctor, while Proctor was the lead investigator in John O'Keefe's death. Our Eli Rosenberg has more on the spider web of people coming under scrutiny post-trial. Good evening, Eli. And Glenn, the continued reaction as well, because for some three hours, dozens of Karen Reed supporters were out front and walking around the DA's office. This is the DA's office here in Canton today. Meanwhile, we're learning a lot more about what transpired during a very heated town meeting here in Canton last night. In Canton this evening, a march around the district attorney's office. This after a second officer now on leave after Karen Reed's nine-week trial. Dominoes have fallen. That's the best way I can say it. Chief Rafferty has placed Kevin Albert on paid administrative leave. Last night during a tense town meeting in Canton. Take your hands off of me. Officials announcing Albert was on paid leave from Canton PD. Relative to his actions in a case he investigated with Michael Proctor approximately two years ago. Albert, seen here in video from a story we did back in 2014, is the brother of Brian Albert, the homeowner where John O'Keefe's body was found in January 2022, launching this investigation in the first place. There should be consequences for their actions. They're held to a higher standard. Albert's administrative leave, while announced last night, actually started June 13th. I was hungover for sure today. But he left his badge in your cruiser after a night of drinking. Days after these texts between Michael Proctor and Albert were shared during Reed's trial. Albert wasn't involved in Reed's investigation, but his name did come up during Proctor's testimony. 99.99% .99 of the cases, the police are absolutely playing it square that uh, the and that their testimony can be relied upon. However, there are those rare cases where things occur that causes the public to doubt the police. It was announced during that heated meeting last night that an outside agency is reviewing the allegations involving Albert. Meanwhile, you may remember last November, town meeting members did approve a contract for an outside agency to review the entire police department. That inquiry continues this evening. Live in Canton, Eli Rosenberg, NBC 10 Boston. Eli, thank you. It can be confusing, so you can find an interactive graphic of who's who in connection with the Karen Reed trial on our website, NBC10Boston.com. It's super helpful. Coming up, Sue O'Connell will return to the table. Her comments on covering this case since spring. We're back in just a moment. The incomparable Sue O'Connell joining us back here at the table. All right, Sue, there has been so much social media around mm -hmm. uh, this case, and that can lead to a lot of disinformation. We've all seen it. When you look back on this case, the first Karen Reed trial, do you feel as if all the extra noise and attention gets us closer or farther away from justice? Um, I think it gets us farther away from justice, but I think as we enter the campaign season for real, it's important for us, each of us, to consider the what we see on social media, what the source is, and what the language is. I had information about the jury on Monday, the day that the, the mistrial was declared. I got it from a reliable source. I checked with our bosses. I couldn't confirm it. We didn't run with it. And then I saw opposite information being spread all over social media. And I'm like, people, you don't, they're guessing. You can't look at people guessing and then say, that's it. If I do something wrong, if I print something or publish something or say something that's factually inaccurate, I can get fired. 
right? That helps keep me on because <laughs> yes. I yeah. want the paycheck. Well, the right? whole idea is two sources. That's right. sort of that, and that's the baseline, baseline for things. So, but now in the world of social media, whether it's this trial, like you said, an election, there's a lot that just gets and put on top out of there. what JC is said, saying, it seems as if people want the echo chamber. And so they, they want only it now. want the right. stuff that they agree with, and they want to amplify. And that. they want it now, and they want to know why you're not reporting it. Like there's a picture we didn't report about. But we haven't confirmed that that picture is an actual picture yet. Right. right. So we, uh, other media outlets uh, reported, but they said things like, it appears to be. Right. 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 So you have to look at the language and the qualifiers. We're going to talk more about this as the campaign season and if we have another And it's trial. not going to get easier. It's only no. going to get more difficult yes. with the AI and technology and yes. everything so else. Be aware. That is our lesson from Sue O'Connell. <laughs> Case is far from over. Karen Reed back in court July 22nd for a status hearing as the Commonwealth prepares a retrial. And of course, you can count on live coverage right here on NBC 10 Boston. Remember, another episode of Canton Confidential as it warrants.